Welcome to Thinking Bros. I'm Chris. And I'm Alex. We're your favorite corner store philosophers trying to figure out life one conundrum at a time. And today we're talking about the difference between experience and competence. So just time spent doing something or maybe, you know, diplo diplomas, titles that we usually attribute to competence and the difference between that and actual competence. So first of all, how strongly do you feel about the competence of what we call experts in our society, Alex? How strongly do I feel? What do you mean by that? Well, how much do you think we should rely on experts in making our life decisions? I think quite a bit because depending on the field, there's so much information in each subtopic in life like in, in medicine and um diet i guess <laughs> in uh, in in any subject there's so much you can learn that one person for sure can't know everything and so the thing is with most people that they won't spend the time to to learn as much as they could and experts do spend that much time and even more time because they have to know everything, the latest news, the all the information we have on that subject. So I think, as a general rule, relying on experts, because they dedicate their life to that, right? Because it is it is their profession most of the time, is a good bet. Okay, the problem I have with that is, essentially, all they should do, at least, is synthesize the empirical evidence that is a present in their field, right? And the way you do that is simply by reading articles that are the, well, essentially that are studies, right? Randomized controlled trials and knowing, I guess, how to interpret them, but even the interpretation is done for you in the conclusion in a way. So I don't think an expert can do that much better than a normal person. But anyway, we can yeah, get into part, that. Part of my point that I said is because my, my instant reaction is that, yeah, we should trust experts, obviously. But I also said most people just don't get into it, right? I think new subjects can be intimidating to people or just people are lazy and they don't have time and stuff like that. I, I think a lot of people could get uh, very close or even more knowledge than an expert uh, in certain topics. But just the fact is that they don't often. Yeah, okay. I, I definitely see that as problematic, especially because one of the points I'm going to make later on, but I, I can just mention it now, and it's the fact that to be an expert that is out there in the field, well, not in the field, but kind of speaking, addressing to the public, addressing the public, you have to, in a way, differentiate yourself from all the other experts, right? Maybe that can be, you know, you take Neil deGrasse Tyson, right? Maybe because other astrophysicists aren't as publicly presentable, and that's what makes them so presentable to the world and such a, a lovable figure. But I just think that you have to differentiate yourself from the field. And the problem with that is that all science is, is an assiduous statistical compilation of what we know as, as, a, as a society. And if you differentiate yourself from that, I feel like there's a problem. Like you either have a novel interpretation that, you know, could shock the world or, you know, all these miracle doctors that suddenly come up with miracle cures to things or uh, come out with, what I'm saying is, if something is determined by science itself, right? Let's say there's a new meta-analysis that kind of rev revolutionizes the way we see, let's say, happiness. That in itself should be the subject of public attention. But why is it always like these experts going on TV and they're the, sub the subject of attention? You know, like in differentiating yourself, I, I get suspicious about what they're bringing to the table because 
science isn't about differentiating yourself. Well, I understand for like novel findings, it that's kind of what it is. But also when you get into the world of science, you understand how one study doesn't accomplish much at all. And in fact, the conclusions reached by one study after having read it, any other scientists can explain it as well as the person who conducted the study, wouldn't you agree? I, I think there's intricacies that when you do a study, when you spend like your months doing the study, exploring all the alternatives, uh, organizing, setting it up, I think you, you think of more things to consider. Or maybe you get sucked down into into specific things and you even forget to look at the bigger picture. So that's possible. But I wanted to say that, I mean, you take Neil deGrasse Tyson as an example. I think what sets him apart is his charisma, as you said, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. And you said what you have to do to stand out as an expert and to have the public listen to you is to separate separate yourself from other scientists. Uh, like, But you framed it as distancing yourself from science. I, I think often what it is is just being charismatic, which... You know, it doesn't happen often. People are, people are, can be good at one thing easily. I don't think it's really easy to like be good at many things. So often scientists are good at science, but not that good speaking with people about their science. And it, it just so happens that Neil deGrasse Tyson is knowledgeable about astrophysics and also is charismatic and can translate the message to the public. But I don't think. I don't think being charismatic, well, I think you would agree that being charismatic doesn't take you away from science. No, it's just, to me, I, I kind of start doubting because it's like he's performing in the field in which we don't attribute the competence to, to him. You know you know what I'm saying? Like, he's an entertainer, but he has the, P, the PhD in astrophysics. So it's just, for, for me, when people kind of, go out of their field and we mistake their competence in astrophysics for another type of comp competence. That's, that's also one of my later points. It's kind of problematic. But what I wanted to mention, I think in the field of science, if we see it as a mission, as a societal mis mission to progress our knowledge, the things that you report in your, let's say, you know, journal article as a you know, the conclusions of your study, the more exact that information is, the more it can contribute to, you know, science, let's say a hundred years down the road, right? Uh, the way in we in which you guide your statistics, the exact population, the, the more, the most like criteria about the people in it that you can report, the, the exact way in which every experiment was done, right? So, I think that seen that way, right, maybe in a perfect world, a person who is a professional entertainer could just read up on a certain subject in science and be as competent, or if not more, actually more is what I would argue, at relaying it to the world. See what I'm saying? I see what you're saying, but I don't agree. I think the reason people find Neil deGrasse Tyson so trustworthy is because he knows there's there's some things on the edges of subjects that we don't really know about like black holes or like is the universe really infinite does it loop around what what happens uh, when's the like opinions about the big bang how the world started and i think what makes him interesting is that he's so very knowledgeable not it's not like research article you read it that's what happened we know that it, it's different scientists that are all experts that all reach different conclusions and he knows all that because he spent the time to read them and in another subject or like also not only read articles also speak with ideas that people are develop uh, speak with the other scientists about ideas they're developing or like discuss new discoveries like that. I think if he ventured in another field, if a, a scientist that's charismatic ventured in another field, he doesn't just have that much exposure to the field in his life. He, he doesn't think about it every day. He can't really know as much. 
about the really advanced stuff, the 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 most current stuff. Yeah. My only problem with you saying that is perhaps, I don't know, maybe Neil deGrasse Tyson is a person who is attributed attributed competence, but is also competent. And maybe the people in advanced uh, astrophysics are listening to his interviews in which he relays what he knows in the very simplest manners that even kids could understand. And maybe they're laughing at it, right? We don't know. Mm -hmm. But... The problem with that is that not knowing that, what you rely on to say to me that he is competent is the fact that he has a book published, the fact that you have seen his face on the TV, and the fact that he has the title of, uh, well, whatever, does he have a PhD? If he does, whatever, you're relying on his uh, certificate of having a PhD, correct? Like, would you say that you're basing your assessment of his competence on more than what I just said? Just a little more, yeah. I, I see your point and I agree with you that there's a certain extent, to a certain extent, a blind trust because, and there's no choice to have a blind trust in some things because what I want to do in my life is not astrophysics and I don't want to spend the time researching astrophysics, but I'm interested in it. Um, and I find it interesting to to listen to that sort of information. But additionally, I also rely on the fact that it's very easy to um, for experts to publicly announce their disagreement with what he's saying. And I think that if the vast majority of the scientific community disagreed with him, we would know. And... I'm sure there's there's disagreements. There's some stuff that experts in the field uh, laugh at him about having, uh, like some opinions he has that people laugh at him for having, but there's some disagreement in the scientific community as it is. I, I, I actually don't believe that because I think the skill of entertainment and the charisma sets him apart so much that you know if you know astrophysics nerd john watson sorry to all the uh, john watsons uh you know that that has been dwelling in a basement and is extremely competent as at what he does and he watches neil degrasse tyson on tv and realizes that you know he doesn't agree with something he said like fundamentally what is he going to do you know is he going to have the same media coverage as Neil, or is does Neil have a cool mustache and he's uh, much cooler to present on TV? Um, and I, I, j I just have trouble seeing how they're going to get the same exposure and reach your ears if they're not as entertaining. Well, I think if there's a big movement, if there's one scientist that disagrees with all the scientists, including Neil deGrasse Tyson, and expresses his opinion, it's probably not going to reach many ears at all. But I see. I see. When it, you when it think get, the, yeah, you the, the majority, the, if if the if he says tr truly something controversial, the majority doesn't have a choice but to kind of oppose that publicly, or a big part. Yeah. Okay. Again, I'm not sure that's the case. I have two examples later on. We'll get to them. I also think that. You know, often the extremists are the, you know, the vocal majority. And if we're just, if we're seeing people talk about advanced astrophysics concepts, even if I have an intuition that that's not true, I don't think I'm going to have, like, the courage to, to address that publicly. So then you're only leaving the scientists on the table. And... The extent to which they're willing to put themselves out there to the same level as Neil deGrasse Tyson would, I have doubts about. Because if they're seeing their field advance and some guys just presenting false facts about the stars on TV, that doesn't really change anything for them. But I again, mean, it changes something for them. They've dedica dedicated their life to this field. 
Yeah, I know, but the, the people who matter in the field aren't going to be fooled by that, so it doesn't really matter. It uh, plus, you know, it's it's maybe a fun example that kind of is apart from everything else because what I was trying to determine is the practical consequences of our conclusions on experience versus competence. And here you take astrophysics, which probably in our lifetime, you and I aren't going to have any practicable, practical, you know, applications on. So anyway, it's a good starting example. So let me get in a, in a small rant to kind of introduce the topic. I was in a philosophy class about Plato and, you know, Socrates. And for some reason, someone said, well, not someone said, actually, the professor said that when Socrates said that I know that I know nothing, it was a mystery what that means. And it's debated what that means for people. Did he mean he actually knows nothing? Did he mean that, I, I don't know. I don't know the different theories because it's clear in my head. So here, here's what it is. No human has access to fundamental truths that rule the universe, right? For gravity, we have a good estimate, right? 9.8 meters per second squared. Importantly, the practical consequences of that usually don't fail us, right? We have a very good op approximation. We operate on that appro approximation. But the truth is we don't have access to the mechanisms that you know behind gravity or the elements c composing the atom or the, the very basic ones at least and we don't truly know what is going on so the why isn't fully answered but the how is and that's important that's the way we operate in life and i think what socrates meant is if you truly think about it everything in our society is an approximation because there there's no way to truly say that something is true right even something as basic as the way we were created some people would in fact a lot of people would say it's through religion right some religious story some others would say through the big bang and it's just a, a highly improbable formation of organic life so what i'm trying to say is if you do accept that we don't have access to absolute truths, anything we know or anything that is held to be true right now is the best approximation we have and therefore can be challenged. But if we trust too much in the people who rule the fields of well, any fields, but, you know, I have more knowledge about psychology at the moment, then th that may be a way to hold back society from progressing in that field. And what I would argue is that we should dissociate, that's not always possible, but dissociate the experts from their experience and actually listen to what they are saying because anyone is capable of saying anything. The truth about the essence of the universe could come out of the mouth of a high person. For those of you who know The Good Place, uh, Doug is portrayed as, in, in, in Paradise, Doug is portrayed as a, a celebrity because he once went on an acid trip and uh, revealed, what, it, what was it, 70% about the truth of the universe and he's, he was the closest approximation anyone has ever had about how heaven and hell works and and we have seen this in the past the worst mistake could come out of the mouth of an expert and people could die right all those accidents and explosions those are those are people we trust with due to their experience and things happen so I also wrote down the bl broken clock example. Imagine uh, someone was taught something, and usually if we're taught something, it's already because it's it's past knowledge, right? Let's say you go to medical school, 
I don't know how often they update it, but let's say you have a standardized curriculum and, you know, they try to keep up with it. But if something is found in the field, it takes years to get accepted and then probably even more years to end up in a manual. And then you learn that manual for like three years and then five years later you apply that. And sure, there are updates, but there's only so much you can do. You were, you set up a shaky foundation of past knowledge and you operate on that through your entire career. So the broken clock example is that a, a broken clock would be correct twice a day, right? Uh, maybe a person who is completely not knowledgeable could accidentally be correct. But imagine setting a clock and expecting the right time from it, but you set it five seconds behind. Most of the time that won't matter, but that that clock that runs is going to be right less times than the broken clock. So that's just an analogy I thought of. I don't know if it's it illustrates anything for you, Alex, but I you just said a lot. I wanted to come back on um on one thing that you said, which was that we should dissociate experts from what they say and question what they're saying to to actually evaluate critically the science behind it. But I think it comes back to look, let's take psychology, for example. There's no the way I see it, there's no certainty right now or maybe ever about the right way to do psychotherapy, right? It it's a young science. It went through a lot of trends already. Um, psychoanalysis, behaviorism, cognitive therapy. And now maybe in the future is going to change more. But you you can't just expect everyone to... Okay, let, let's say it this way. If, if we're talking about practicality, you can't start from the ground up and have a blank blank slate completely and build uh, a, an idea of the human psychology from the ground up for every person, for every new psychology student, let's say. You have to like trust the effectiveness of what has been found at least a little bit. And that's when you apply it in practice and you see how it works on a patient, let's say, that's when you see its flaws best and that's how you modify and innovate the field. Um, I think partly my point is that you have to trust the science, at least partly, to do something. Otherwise, you're just doing research and developing ideas for the first, I don't know, 20 years of your career and then you're you're doing doing something, something with it. I think it's useful to have um, these ideas that you portrayed as like, oh, it's it's five years old, it doesn't apply anymore, we found out other stuff, but it's also ideas that in most fields have been tested and work at least partly. You have to have that as a basis and then you, you can go off on your own things. And I think that's how, that's how it works in psychology, right? People were very big fans of Freud and then his followers changed his theories a bit. And then other people that went to psychoanalysis then when when they discovered that it had some flaws um dissociated from it and went into cognitive behavioral therapy i can see what you're saying and i i see that happening in a perfect world uh maybe it even happens for the majority of scientists but maybe not for the vocal majority because let's say if you take freud now at the end of his life right having done everything that he has done and then you take a psychology student that just finished his uh i don't know they just let's say they finished their phd i feel like they they would be more useful than freud is in, in the modern psychological world wouldn't wouldn't you agree no i know i know you're going to say yeah but without the we without what freud brought to the world that would be impossible but i think it is possible it's just we often don't pay attention to people who don't have big titles and someone could have done, someone could have diverged uh, psychoanalysis in their own way, but not have been as popular as Freud 
in his time and have done maybe not as much progress as we have right now, but in a better direction, having done a little bit less progress than Freud, but in a direction that is actually more accurate to the standards that we know now. What I'm saying is nothing we know is 100% true, right? So it's the best approximation. So once you, you accept that, everything that we're building right now is on a faulty found foundation. And then we're just trying to do experiments to kind of maybe find those faulty foundations. But what if something, what if someone kind of accelerates that and has intuitions or better reasoning and drops those faulty foundations directly and then tries to build on top of those uh, newly found foundations, rationally found fi foundations, right? What I'm trying to say is like, first of all, science isn't everything. And second of all, a person, well, again, I, I've already said it, someone who doesn't have the modern certifications of a scientist could have more insight into the actual truth of the universe or the actual truth of psychology just because they're not out there like worrying about standardization. Okay. You're you're right. And I think you're imagining an ideal world where that actually does happen. Uh, I think the way discoveries are made for humans is that you have to drown yourself in in theory and information about a certain subject and creativity comes from a deep knowledge of the of a certain field if you know a lot you you start connecting dots and finding or approximating the truth of the universe but only when you know a lot and i think knowing a lot includes past theories and seeing how they are flawed and critically evaluating them i, I agree with that but i also think that again perfect rationality can have a lot to do with how well you operate in a field because once you there's let's say there's a baseline of knowledge and once you you could say that you talk the language of that field right once you talk the language of psychology i don't know what that would mean maybe you know you know the big five the different functions of the brain. Let's say you just are versed. You can talk to psychologists and understand pretty much everything they're saying. I think not even knowing past discoveries, you can, well, again, being versed in something today would just mean knowing the standards of it today. I think let's just pass on that and maybe come back to it because I have a kind of structured way to come to okay. points. But anyway. I think the biggest point I'm trying to make today is not, uh, you know, uh, tear down experts and put the individual on the stand. They know everything. No, no, no. It's just, I think what experts bring to the table is put to the extreme these days, right? You hear something on TV. Oh, you check, you check what they have. Oh, they have a PhD. Well, then I must apply this because they know what they're talking about. Well, you don't know their intentions. If they're out there on the TV, that means they're different from the next scientist. What does that mean to you? Are they more char charismatic and better at showing it to you? Or maybe they just use their PhD to make something up and become popular? What does that exactly mean? So the biggest thing I'm trying to assert today is that the average person should not simply give too much value to the certifications that someone has. And whenever you hear anything, and that comes back to our episode one, you should judge that information for what it is. Okay, you heard something. Let's find out more information. Okay, they have a PhD. That I guess that means something. It doesn't mean nothing. But what what are the next questions? What are what are the next steps? Do do does their point involve sound reasoning? Does it state provable premises? And that means. Does it quote a certain, you know, meta-analysis that you can check out for yourself and go read? Are its applications effective? Have you tried it out? Or are you going to tell your friends that something is true because you heard it on the TV? The next time an expert quotes a study, I, I would just love for people who are listening, if, if anyone is, maybe, maybe we're both crazy, but 
to actually go and read the study, right? Even maybe the conclusion sometimes suffices to understand that they're misinterpreting. Oh, by the way, it's so easy to misinterpret findings, right? I had an entire class, undergraduate class with people in first year psychology. They're, those are people who are essentially just finished high school. A few months separate them from people who finished high school. And the entire class was reading articles and finding what was wrong with the reasoning or the statistics or the way they interpreted the statistics in those articles. And those are people with PhDs with 20 plus years of experience in the field who are just sitting there in an undergraduate class, high school graduates, just tearing down articles and the, their reasoning. In any case, let's go to the athlete example. Okay, a young athlete at the beginning of the Olympics, which he would potentially win if he was accepted, is considered a worse at athlete than the veteran who has won five silver medals in the past five years. Essentially, let's say there's a new and young athlete who, if accepted to the Olympics by their country, would be the gold winner. But we're going to see the person who is the veteran and has secured the, the silver medals as a better choice. And that's because of a lack of co consideration of the person who doesn't have that resume, that CV. And I think it's, it's definitely, you know, in trying to make my do my research on this episode, I've found two fields talking about experts, right? The importance of experts or competence or experience. And it was the legal field. And I'm going to quote something from that later on uh, where they, you know, they call experts the people who are called to the stand and uh, have to what, what testify. Be the word? testify. Thank you. Uh, in front of everyone to kind of bring a new light to the evidence. But there's something to be learned from that. We'll, we'll learn that in later quotes. And the other one was about recruitment experts saying that <laughs> experience in a field doesn't instantly translate to competence. And that's kind of that example, right? The Olympic athlete example. I think through the globalization and the accessibility of everything and through technology, we've become a world that has so many options as recruiters do these days you know there are people from other countries who could apply to their job in in an instant right sending their cv email everything is set up in a way where yeah it's very cognitively demanding to to go out and filter information by yourself and we've created this these categories, which, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's the definition of a stereotype. These categories where you see, oh, doctor in something. Okay, that person knows what they're talking about. So I'm not going to waste cognitive resources on determining if it's true or not, because more often than not, it will be true, right? I mean, I don't think that's a stereotype. Well, that's, isn't that what a stereotype means? Um, I'll look it up, I'll look it up. A set of pre preconceived notions that you have off of just knowing one information about a person? A widely held but fixed and oversimplified image or idea of a particular type of person or thing. That's exactly what it is. Okay, if overly simplified, I, maybe I can relate to that, but... Well, it's fixed and oversimplified. Wouldn't you agree with that? Like, oh, PhD, that person knows what they're talking about. And when, when you see these miracle doctors on TV that are saying things, well, I just have trouble imagining because if all science information is to be made public, which is the dream of science in a way, right? Uh, I don't know, you publish everything and you let your colleagues or in the field build on that. That's what the mission of science is. How could one person have this miracle cure and have this incredible perspective if everything they know must be backed, if the scientific method in its rigor 
must be backed by meta-analyses to even assert something, right? H how do people go out of the norm? Like, how how's it? I mean, possible? often often they don't. It's rare that that happens. I don't think it's that rare. Anyway, I I have a. I have a, little, a few examples later on, but okay. So, do do you like the athlete example? Do you think that's it's, it's valuable? Is it too idealistic to think that you know every young athlete could be considered for the Olympics? Or I think there's um, there's something to what you're saying, um, but I also think that we're, we've been talking a lot about science, but I think it applies in sports too. If a truth has to come out, it will come out. Maybe it'll take a couple more years for that athlete to prove himself and and overcome the veteran. But what what's also on the line for a country or for whatever recruitment agency makes the decision of choosing athletes for the Olympics is consistency. Uh, what they know about the veteran is that he's consistently uh, resisted the, the the like pressure of being in the Olympics, and he's performed every time. And they know that in front of a public, he doesn't choke because he has five silver medals. Um, he doesn't get injured often. Um, I'm thinking of of Zion Williamson and and LeBron James. You know, LeBron is old and he's still really really good and maybe there's some young recruits that have the potential to be better than him but he's proven himself so consistent and so good over all his career that he's a safe bet and if even if it's not ultimately the right decision to keep him instead of a hot new recruit it's uh justified and it's, it's even like recommendable you know because nobody knows the truth of the universe as you said i i definitely agree and i also think that there's something very important i didn't mention and it was the fact that to me competence is what determines an expert right the results they get and lebron james is a great example because no one can say oh he just you know has 20 years of experience where, oh, he has a PhD in basketball. Like, you don't really know what that means to a certain extent once when, when someone says that. But what we do know is his statistics, right? Hit the way, the number of goals he makes per year, well, buckets, I don't, I don't know the terminology, but... <laughs> Points per game. <laughs> Points per game, thank you. So, actually, that's a great example of someone who I would call an expert proudly because... Well, he has demonstrated competence, and that's all it is. And again, the athlete example isn't great because who I'm trying to bring down is the person who has gotten silver medals for the past five years, but that's not even my point right now. My point is, I have the, the example later on, but someone who works five years as a... As a cop, as a cop in a mall, versus someone who works, I don't know, two years and what's something more dangerous? What was it? Oh yeah, yeah, as a bodyguard for a celebrity, or whatever you want to say, as a more dangerous security job is. The first person who worked as a mall cop is going to tell you, yeah, I I have five years in security, five years of experience in security. And these days, because of the cognitive laziness, we're just going to accept that and, and tell ourselves, well, yeah, this this person has competence in this field. But I'm not sure that these days is justified. I mean, I, I think, think it is. Always I think it been is. like that. I think it okay. is because back in the day, you, let's say, when Socrates, you know, when Socrates or Plato, whatever, Plato, Socrates, uh, this is one of the points he makes is, that whenever you want, you know, to be better, get better at something or know something, you you must refer to experts. And what that used to mean, right? I mean, we're gonna have a later episode on this, but in a world of more more of a a world of survival and not of a world of commodities, 
what they used to mean is directly competence because the only way you could be noticed is through your competence right let's say it was a unique skill to know how to write and read the only way in which you were competent on that is through demonstrating that you can write and read these days it's because we've standardized so much because of this you know this fast-paced society you standardize standardize you know uh, multiple choice answers if you are lucky enough and you circle all A's on an exam, that could al almost mean that, you know, you have a certain certificate. And you could be considered competent in a field just because you say, oh, I, well, I passed this exam. That's, that's I feel like that's what it means these days. Back in the day, it was like, are you, you know, the strongest human? Yes? Okay, we're, we'll, we're going to put you in, in a a battlefield and if you come out victorious that's what competence means you're, these days you're it's considered like... competent in a field if you're you keep saying phd you have a phd when you've proven that you can uh create independent research in a field it's not just taking an exam and no you can't just circle all a's and pass an exam uh, you you have supervisors that are experts in the field that evaluate how you work and how you interpret research and the way you do your research and only then when you're evaluated by your by superiors that like know more about the science than you then you're deemed knowledgeable enough to be considered an expert okay yeah i know the phd is to a higher level but i, I still think it's standardized in a way where a person who doesn't have phd could be more competent at something that someone who does is just they didn't have a chance to prove themselves at it. I think you're right. I mean, if, if part of your point is that, and I agree with that, that a person that doesn't have a PhD could be more knowledgeable than a person with a PhD, but practically the thing that is true almost all of the time is that that's not true. Yeah, okay. I, I understand. And it comes back to our first episode. I think if someone on the TV with a PhD says information X and then someone who has absolutely no, no certifications in your life or at a cafe tells you why on a current issue, maybe, yeah, if you're put at gunpoint to have to choose between the two instantly, I would choose the opinion of the person with the PhD. That's fair. But I think, and what I'm trying to, trying to establish is that None of the two should be put on, on a pedestal. And most of the time, we have the time to work with the information with, we receive. And as we've determined in our, our episode on judging, you should, you should take that time and get more information on it. I, I'm truly oh, just... I wanted, yeah. Uh, okay. Well, what I'm trying to establish in my mission here is simply to remove the barrier that we have with people with PhD or with experts in a field and make you understand that we're all just humans, okay? Yes, that person technically got a three-year bachelor's and they were taught introductory courses to whatever they're doing. Yes, they worked on a PhD and... Uh, went to classes to discuss some articles they read in their field. Yes, they made a novel discovery in their field that, that was then peer-reviewed and uh, accepted by the PhD board or whatever. But they're not, you know, gods of that field with whom you cannot argue, who you don't, ha you don't have to double-check everything they say. Who, who whose reasoning you cannot challenge, right? What if they're presenting? What if you truly break down what they're saying and structure it as a logical argument? The premises would then be the findings that they quote, and usually they have to kind of quote the specific papers from which the findings arrive. Okay, so you have the premises. If it takes them 
30 minutes to understand the article and it takes you three hours because you have to look over every term, but then do it, right? If it's something that is important to you, you should do it. So, okay, we've established the premises. Is the reasoning correct? Is the reasoning they use to make conclusions based on what the article finds correct? And I'm going to tell you that quite often it's not. When you want to shock the world, when you want to gain popularity, you're going to misquote a study and say, this study found this. Well, okay, but when you get to the intricacies of it, this study found this in this subgroup in these circumstances uh, with this sample size. And I, I'm just trying to break down the, the, the extreme barrier we attribute to experts. And I think more time should be spent, if possible, of course, on uh, critiquing, critically thinking about what they say. <laughs> Not necessarily critiquing. Yeah, I, I think you undersold the education, though. Okay, I don't, I agree that currently, yeah, get, getting an undergrad doesn't mean much. But then I think a PhD is you're spending, I don't know, six, five, six years immersed in um, in the subject, surrounded with people that talk about the subject, uh, passing tests, getting cl advanced classes from experts, uh, finding novel research, reading so much research that you get the papers instantly after that, um, or get them much easier. You get a lot of knowledge that builds into your like knowledge system in your head. You have so much that you develop an intuition about the subject. And I'm, I'm tempted to stray away from what we're doing, but I think that you're underselling the education they're getting. And also I think that it's idealistic to uh, think, I, I agree with you that people shouldn't trust everyone on their word and just go along with it. And, um, I mean, when you really think about it, most people don't have a foundation at all for some of the things they believe, apart from someone on the TV said it. Um, and I don't really think that's useful in a, in a, in a debate, you know, with someone who, um, if you apply your own logic and research the stuff in a discussion with you, that, pe that person is going to get demolished if you have a different opinion because of the research you've done on your own, because they don't know nothing. They don't know not only the information they're supposed to know, the justification behind why the scientist on the TV is saying what they're saying. They don't even know how to argue the points and um, deny what you're saying, because they don't know the reason behind what they believe. And I don't think that's good at all. But I also think that um, most of the time, well, I mean, there's so much stuff to know that you can't have time for everything to uh, look into for three hours each discovery that, uh, you know, you said experts may read the article in three hour, in 30 minutes and you read them in, in three hours. If it takes that long, you can't do that for all aspects of your life. And it's a really useful heuristic. And most of the time, it's a good heuristic. And you seem to be like ignoring the scientific community surrounding those scientists. I, I, my maybe idealistic conception is that eventually the truth will come out okay. from the scientific I, community because it will be peer reviewed. I definitely disagree with the fact that the truth will come out. You know, there as much are, as there are like better players than Messi somewhere hidden in a in some faraway country that have no, have never seen the the light of a recruiter there that are playing like barefoot on like asphalt and as much as there are great musical artists that have never made the right marketing decisions i think there are great scientists that don't have a presentable face on tv that have much more to offer than the, the scientists we hear from today i also think I don't think you have to have a pretty face and appear on TV to prove your point. I think it's in the in the like the quality of your argumentation and the solidness of your reasoning and okay, reaching well, your conclusions. Okay, well, I, I your definitely research. think that's idealistic. I, I I don't know how to demonstrate it to you, but do you think? Okay, 
you said scientists are surrounded by the scientific community, but I think, yeah, well, obviously we're influenced by our environment, but I don't think any individual scientist can like speak for the community. I think, I think research no, yeah. and articles and meta analyses, they can, right? They're surrounded by the community in the sense that none of them could have been published if 10 people don't sign off on it, right? In the case of meta-analyses, it's even better. Every single study was peer-reviewed and then the meta-analysis was peer-reviewed and then we can talk about what approaches more a fact, right? And in that sense, I think we undersell, well, yeah, we'll talk, we'll get into education, but we undersell what a normal person can do because as long as you have reasoning, and you are presented with the same facts as other people, you can, well, you know, you, you're both working with the same premises. Maybe that other person has even more premises in mind by knowing the field, but how is your reasoning flawed, right? Let's say a scientist tells you, well, here's a study, and I think you should smile more because that will make you more happy. And then you see a, this, you read the study, and they represented the concept of happiness as time spent smiling. Right. Okay. Maybe that's an oversimplification of the mistakes psychologists makes may make. But anyone well, who is definitely fan, is. Well, I don't think it definitely is. I think it's a caricature, and maybe it's taken to the extreme. But I think it's it does get ridiculous to that level at times. Okay. Well, like you've read Tal Yarkoni's the generalizability crisis, right? Wouldn't you agree that maybe I'm caricat caricaturizing, but it's it's not that far far of a stretch. I mean, yeah, it's not that far of a stretch for some things, I suppose, but it is, you know, a joke. <laughs> yeah, it is a joke, but whatever. And so you're presented with that, and then scientist says, you know, you should spend spend more time uh, in your day smiling. But then when you're versed in something, you're just a, an average human being. Well, no, not average, because I've interacted with average people. That's that's It's very sad, but... Just a person who has taken the time to be well versed in things, right? Tried to apply critical thinking, and you understand. First of all, you can't oversimplify a, a concept as complex as happiness to the physical manifestation of smiling. Second of all, you can't infer a directionality to the relationship. You can't say smiling causes causes happiness just because the two are correlated. Right, those are two things I can say by being a normal person. And this, what can the scientists do? Right, I, I think a lot of concepts are inferred in ero erone erroneous, mm -hmm. erroneous ways. And I, I think as an average pe person, we can, we can take the time to to make those uh, assessments in our head. I don't think I it's think harmful. You're idealizing the average or not the average person the the non-expert person like i think you're suffering from the dunning kruger effect where like your low level low level of knowledge about those fields you're hypothesizing about is making you overconfident in your ability to understand those concepts physics contain a lot of math that you would not understand and that's hard to learn um, if you're able to speak like this about psychology, it's because you've had an undergraduate education on it. And the average person, as you said, you avoided that because, I don't know, 70% of the population for sure cannot do the things you're saying, obviously can do the things you're saying. And if a, an average person can do that so well, or like a, a person that's not an expert can do that so well, then why don't you just like go ahead and do it? Like look at the reviews, look at the researches that you disagree with, uh, express public disagreement. Yes, the many researches that have been done. <laughs> look at them, uh, analyze them, critique the experts of the experts and find the flaws. And I mean, I, I don't think it's crazy of me to say that if you go out and seek resources that can help you publicize your opinions that, like, that are uh, more correct than the experts which are wrong, you will find support. And people, if your argumentation is good enough, will, you know, start.
start to side with you. Okay, too idealistic for me, but what I'm trying to say is that we, we live pretty standard lives. It's not even that many instances that you hear a certain expert, and I want you to like go out there and double check what they're saying, right? What I'm saying is, for these like practical changes in your life, right? Let's say someone tells you, oh, you know, shampoo is a myth. You hear someone like revolutionizing that, like, well, yeah, the shampoo industry sold you the shampoo, but you can actually just wash your your hair with it with water and be okay after a while. Well, like those like in quotes life changing things that are heard mm -hmm. on the TV, right? I, I don't even think that it happens that often. But these like big decisions, uh, I don't know, going vegan, uh, recycling more. Instead well, of like, okay. no, no, no. But like, honestly, you, you do, I don't think you receive new information about those things that many times in your life. But at times people just hear about things and they, they're willing to make that change simply due to the fact that they have heard it. Right. And they just kind of believe in the outcomes because the person was certified. I don't know. I, I just want to meet people to ask more questions in those situations. Right. Wasn't doesn't recycling not work? I feel like I feel like I, I looked at the statistics. I think recycling isn't really working out for us. No comment. OK, no comment because we can't pull up the statistics right now. Let's, let's talk about degrees. Right. You kind of criticize my underselling of uh, education. But what I would argue a degree is, is it's not that you have to assume, but you can't count out that the minimum was done to obtain these degrees. So an undergraduate degree, right? Uh, or not. Yeah. An undergraduate degree would mean bachelor's, right? That's what it yeah, means. I, yeah. Okay. Also, I think the, the job of the people that set up the programs is that doing the bare minimum to obtain that degree, if you obtain that degree, that means you have like the adequate amount of education but yeah I mean. yeah but okay as someone who has figured out how to do the bare minimum in in an <laughs> undergraduate degree minimum. i would like yeah less than bare minimum i would like to speak with that expertise and tell you that if if you if someone has a certificate like like a bachelor's i i i don't know what that means uh, to a lot of people it's like okay well they can, he can know something, right? Okay, let me read my paragraph that I wrote. Degrees are standardizations of minimal knowledge you must have to operate within a field. If someone tells you they have a philosophy degree, your reaction shouldn't be, oh, this person must be competent in philosophy. It should be, oh, this person is plausibly competent enough to operate in the field of philosophy. Now, what have they done with this capability? Have they come to novel conclusions? Have they developed a new philosophy? Or just waved around their degree. Okay, that's a little bit, you know, that's a little bit of me coming out on that. But I'm sure all the philosophy profs listening will agree. The extent of our audience is, yeah, if a philosophy professors. <laughs> there is nothing sadder than the average undergraduate philosophy paper. Okay, you have anything else to say about that? I think we have, we put too much value in diplomas. I I think there are multiple ways of obtaining diplomas. I think... You can cheat your way through it. You can memorize the, the day before an exam and every exam, in fact, and forget it the day after, not use the proper ways of remembering things or even making them your intuitions. I'm speaking okay, from firsthand to, to experience. Be, yeah. To be an expert, I don't think an undergrad qualifies you as an expert. I think, as as usual, I agree with the sort of general point you're trying to make, but I disagree with the degree to which you take your conclusions, uh, I guess. Because, yeah, knowing you, knowing your disinterest in your undergraduate and how just being good at school, right? There's, it's, it's definitely like a separate skill to just be good at school and uh, be able to take exams, even if it's not a topic that uh, lights you up or that you're super interested in. You could just be at, be good at school, not, or like find out much less than you're supposed to do during your undergraduate and pass it just because you're good at circling circles in exams. 
you learn the stuff by heart and forget it right after you cheat you you do stuff like that that that, that are shortcuts to get through your undergraduate degree but listen i don't think you or me know exactly the the procedure to getting a phd but i'm sure it's and once again i'm more inclined to trust that sort of process than you are clearly but that it's more rigorous and that it filters out a lot more people yeah okay so i i agree that the more you get advanced the the harder it is to say for me that you aren't maybe competent in a field especially with a phd having done a novel finding and a confirmation of that but i i also think that people do wave around their bachelors and their masters and i think that means less than what we give it credit for i think people a lot of people say don't judge by people's appearance well i would actually say don't judge by people's degrees it's it's a standardized way of kind of acquiring again minimal knowledge in a field i i don't there's no other way to put it for me sure but if, if your beef is specifically with experts, we're not talking about experts when we're talking about people with undergraduate degrees. Yeah, I, I know what you're saying, but mm -hmm. I think a lot of people have that misconception that people with undergraduates are yeah, more are... knowledgeable than they truly are. Yeah, 100%. I, th I think whenever you say I have a, you know, a degree in X, people give them that more value than it actually holds. Yeah, I think that's true. Seeing people in an undergraduate and seeing how um, dumb they can be, I don't think it's going to change in in the like four years they have they're doing their undergraduate. I think some people are just here, like getting through school, not even being interested in the subject, uh, just passing their tests. I definitely agree with you on uh, undergraduate, on the under, undergraduate part of your argument. Yeah. Okay. So have you, have you ever seen, I don't, I don't really want to get into that, like life examples, but have you ever seen those debates with like Ben Shapiro or, uh, you know, public debates and mm -hmm. before saying their question, people say, well, I actually have uh, two bachelor's degrees, one in this and the, one in this. So I actually know mm -hmm. what I'm talking about. Okay. If that rings a bell to you or, you know, in anyone's life, I I would like you to not give it the same value that you gave it before. I, I don't think that means anything. And I, I would love for people to spend their cognitive resources criticizing what is said after that in the conversation. What is the actual question that the people ask? What are the things that you learn from the people? Are they to be trusted? Did you double check them? Right. Those are the, the important questions, not what degree this person has. I think you're right. Yeah. The there's too much value placed on degrees and it undergraduate once again, but just the way I see it in, in a conversation, a person shouldn't say, Oh, uh, I have a PhD in this. So when I talk to you about this, you should have the preconceived notion that I'm more competent than you and listen to what I'm saying. I think people's competence shows up in how they talk to you. I think you know when someone is knowledgeable about something and you know when they're not. Um, yeah, and sometimes you might be fooled by the placebo effect of a degree. And I, you know, I just like to conclude that part of, if, if you agree to conclude it, with the fact that degrees, what they are now, are simply a certain forged path that has been societally determined to to standardize a field comp well not competence but experience in a field well enough to to earn you a certain title and directly in in the bigger picture that truly doesn't mean anything a person has set up a certain way of determining did you reach these standards Okay, does that mean they're more competent than a person who doesn't have, didn't meet those standards? Not necessarily, truly. In not general, yes. Uh, well, okay, again, I don't, I don't think so, but 
well, okay, in general, too far again. I think I, that you're more knowledgeable than in psychology, even though you weren't interested during your undergraduate, than most of the people. Most or just walk around in the street. Yeah, okay. But yeah. what I'm saying is that maybe that's due to the interest I did give give to it or the time that I had to spend on it because I was that in that undergraduate degree. But what I'm saying is you take someone who has a hobby for a certain thing, just because they didn't follow the pre -con preconceived, pre-built path of having a certain degree doesn't mean that they're less skillful if they have spent more time or maybe even more valuable time researching something I, I don't think they should be discredited by not having degree x on their cv is what i'm trying to say is that people with hobbies or the people who have taken the time invest them those, themselves in something shouldn't be discredited simply to due to uh, the fact that they didn't follow the preconceived path can we agree on that or Yes, we can agree on that. All right. Also, coming back to my point on time spent on a job, I think the two ways we, you know, cognitively lazily determine competence these days is through degrees, which we have, have determined not to directly equal competence, and through time spent on a job. But I think to me, coming back to the minimal criteria, when someone says, I have worked x years in something what that means to me is that well i haven't gotten fired for let's say 10 years from this job that's what they're saying to me right i have worked five years in security okay so let's take the minimal criteria of that what that could mean you didn't get fired as a cop mall sorry to all mall cops listening for from that work right and you know you, you see these people i don't know if you've encountered them but who have worked like 20 years in a certain position and aren't that much more competent that, than any other new, new recruit, right? The, I don't know, people working in customer service or maybe you see them at, a, at, at shops. Maybe they're like district managers and have worked five years and they're just not that competent they're, they're at their job and simply because they didn't get fired for five years that qualifies them for something. Uh, what I'm trying to see through this is the passion and the interest you actually have for a certain job and the things you accomplish at that job should count for much more than the time spent on a job. And a lot of the time, you know, in, in giving a virtual resume, people will say, well, okay, I have this degree and I have these years of experience in the field, correct? Like, I, I think that kind mm -hmm. of summarizes the way we we see competence. Well, I know it would be a too strong of a statement, but to me, I, I simply ignore when they say that because I'm interested in hearing what they're actually going to bring to me as knowledge. But maybe you shouldn't I, ignore it. Maybe you should be critical of it. What does that truly mean? What does that mean that you worked 10 years in customer service? Did you answer phones every 30 minutes and tell people to, uh, you know, turn off and then turn on their computer again? Is, is that exactly what happened I, i'm just interested in exactly what that means yes uh, i think saying that you would definitely ignore it is too strong of a statement especially considering our episode one on judging that is a very very good shortcut to knowing the level of of knowledge they have i, I think you're talking about a specific case which you know i i can't help but agree with you that I can see a world where someone that has low dedication in a certain topic, works 20 years in it, is given more credit than someone who's, you know, young, inexperienced, but has such a burning passion for the subject and has done so much of his independent research that it, they're more competent than the person with 20 years of experience. But I don't think, gen I don't think generally that that's the, the rule, you know. I think what's in the background, working in the background is the assumption that people are people. Like there's not one person that's exceptional that has zero experience and is the best, you know? If we're, yeah, yeah. People like assume everyone is has the same level of interest and then see, okay, this person have has five years of experience, this person has 20 years of experience, 
I'm going to choose the 20 years of experience, which is not a, a good assumption in all cases. And brings me to my next point, which is when we're talking about science, you know, and now you're talking about being a, a person that works in security. The, the thing with sports, when we're talking about LeBron, is that, okay, points per game, bam, you see it right in front of you, easy. In science and in working security jobs, it is insanely hard to get an actual measurement of competence. Um, not the same things happen at your job that happened to another person. You didn't have a chance to exercise your uh, competence in the same way. Since it's really hard to get an estimate in, I don't know, security and science, in science, what is it? Like coming up with, coming up with novel ideas and and independent research on your own, I guess. It's hard to exactly pin down how competent a person are and especially hard to pin down how competent a person is um, like when you don't know them, when you see only their CV. So it's a, it is a shortcut, but you don't have time to evaluate each person independently that claims they are, they're an expert in the, in the field even though they have no experience. Okay. I, I love what you said, but I think you always have more time to judge people and therefore get more information on those people than their CV says, okay? I think we both very much agree on the fact that if you only have access to a person's CV, it's better than not have, having it and it's a good approximation of their knowledge in the field, right? Let's say you have degree X and Y, okay. Over a person who doesn't have a degree X and Y, I would agree that that person is pro probably more competent. But what I'm saying is, there is much more to life than the standardized way we uh, illustrate competence, right? Let's say you take, uh, sorry to all mall cops listening again, but you take a mall cop who is going to tell you that they worked in security for five years, and then you take someone who on the weekends, they go to a shooting range and they shoot a gun, okay? On paper, in a shootout or as a security guard, let's just, let's just say that you would like the mall cop because they have experience in security. But I would very much feel safer with the person who goes to the range, the shooting range every weekend for the last five years and that has that hobby because their actual experience would make them more skilled with a firearm, right? And I think that I'm very selective with the people that I let into my life. And I hope that people value themselves enough to do the same. And once you do that, I think you should, you know, go to step seven in judging someone who is let into your life, but their CV is step one, right? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So to me, okay, you, you give these standardizations. If I have no, no more time to in interrogate someone, I'm going to use that as useful information. But I think a person who is very caring and is, you know, you know this uh, situation, but who acts as the, the, the psychologist among the, the group of friends and who people always go to when they're in distress and who for the past five years has been kind of the psychologist of their group, well, psychologist in the loose sense of the term, and has, you know, has had exposure to human emotion and is simply, you know, that's simply a role in a friend group. That's not something you would see on a CV. I think they're much more skilled at being a psychologist than a person with a bachelor in psychology. You understand what I'm saying? Like in the actual Well, terms. unless unless the person with the bachelor in psychology is also the psychologist of, of the friend group. Of course. And but... I can totally see what you're saying happening. I, I think, I mean, I, I'm not sure exactly to what extent you're you're trying to take this but what what you've said so far i definitely agree with it's possible that a person with no certification that has no way of proving it in in those standardized ways can be more competent than the person that does have that but when you're talking about friends that you let into your life and then you can find out more about Sure, but 
I, I think it's always a, 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 you know, a shortcut to knowing stuff about people. Yeah, basically, yeah, I'm saying we, we I, I agree with that. you, and I don't see. Yeah, I don't see what what exactly you're saying. What I'm saying, well, what I'm saying is that experience on a job is kind of the same idealization of experience and competence as degrees are, and the moment you have a second more to spend on judging the competence of someone, you should diverge from that title for the years of experience. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah. I think that if you have the time to get to know a person and well, get to know a person in the sense that know how, how much they know about their job and how competent they are, you can, I can definitely see it happening that you find that a person with less experience is more competent. But I would argue the thing that, over and above all, what I would argue is that we often do have the time. <laughs> yeah, we often do have the time. Okay. What? What? Practically, give me an example of a situation where you would have to do that, where it would be useful to do that. Where I, I feel like you have like a a problem with this. So what? Like. What's your problem? And okay, Here, here's what the needs problem. To be fixed? Here's the problem. I think I think I wrote fixed. it down somewhere. It's, you know, those those other our competitor comp competitor podcasts. They invite <laughs> people with these degrees and these experience in the field, these experiences in the field, and they are supposed to be more competent than the people we are going to eventually invite or that we have invited simply due to their degrees. But, and I have examples of this later, sometimes they have malicious intent in mind and they're going to use their degrees to become the next miracle doctor and state facts that are simply false. And due to the shock value of those facts, or, well, false facts, they're going to get more attention. I think we're privileged in the sense that philosophy itself is the discussion of the found foundational elements of life and uh, the human condition. And we can invite people who don't have a degree in philosophy, but have life experiences in the sense that they have lived. And I think their experience supersedes anything that an expert would have, right? I think if we invited a family therapist, I think we would have gotten different information than we did uh, we got out of our last episode on family. But I don't think we'd have we would have gotten necessarily more valuable information because I think someone who values fam family to me is someone who is knowledgeable about family because they have spent the time and care putting their thought and you know passion into that subject. But I, I, on I, paper. The you're going to uh, just just finishing my point on paper you're going to take the family therapist and say well i would l much rather speak to them and that's because of the the cognitive laziness if you actually think about what they do well they they were taught standardized things standardized things from a manual or like you know cbt something that was d determined to kind of be more effective yeah well be more effective or be, be acceptable in a field be reproducible whatever and they, maybe they've been exposed to many families, but maybe a lot of passion for the, one's own family is more valuable in that sense. And I would love to have a discussion with both, which is why I'm not saying, well, experts are nothing. Experts are nothing. I'm, I'm saying, one, I think they shouldn't be put on a pedestal because even they can, one, make mistakes, two, have malicious intent, three, you know, falsely operate on a, a shaky baseline that was given to them by you know, outdated education. And two, I think we should give more value to the regular people who don't have those degrees because they have a lot of valuable information to share. And when you spend the time learning about it, you know, you look over a last episode, well, does it matter that they're not a family therapist? Is what they said valuable to you? Well, that, that's all that should ever matter. I think the way you're saying this stuff, it's hard to disagree with you because your ultimate conclusions are so 
uh, like restricted, I guess you, you're saying the last episode we had on family and the, the person we invited on, they had different information than what a family therapist could offer. And the family therapist would not necessarily have offered more information. I mean, or no, no, more valuable information. Okay. But the, the word I'm, I'm sticking on is necessarily, right? It's okay. Like, sure. Maybe they wouldn't have had more information because you picked the family therapist that's incompetent and out of practice. Uh, I can see all that stuff happening. And, you know, I asked you for an example of, okay, I, I can definitely see it being true that someone with less um, credentials, let's call it that education and experience is more competent than someone with better credentials. I can see that happening. I agree with you. But then the example you gave of how to apply it is inviting people on a podcast, right? But you said that we have time to vet people oftentimes. But the thing is, like, if you're, if you're going to have an invitee on a very popular podcast, and let's say Chris from Thinking Bros thinks he's very competent in a certain sub subject in philosophy. Um, the host of the podcast is not going to take the time to speak with you. And he probably shouldn't because I'm sure there's other people that I'm not discrediting your competence. Maybe you are competent enough to, to go on there and to um, reason at the same level as a PhD philosopher. But I'm sure there's a lot of people that are confident, and I think you'd, you'd agree, that are overconfident on their capacity to discuss that stuff. And I think it's a useful shortcut, one, but I would say further that it's often good to use that shortcut because otherwise you're just wasting time. Okay, well, let's say you take, let's just categorize it and make some analyses, right? Let's say you take all PhD philosophy Teachers, right? PhD philosophers? Yeah, PhD philosophers. Okay. Doc doctors in philosophy. And then you take all the rest of the population, okay? Let's say if you are exposed to them and you give them the chance to talk to you about a certain subject in philosophy, let's say 70% of doctors in philosophy are going to produce an interesting talk with, with you. Mm -hmm. And 15 to 20 percent of all the other people are going to produce a normal talk to talk with you. I think that's very overestimated and I, I depending on the depth of the philosophical subject but yeah yeah but again when you get into the intricacies of of a field the, those are things that are only interesting to people in that field right who, you know like who who cares about the you know Okay, that's not even that int intricate, but the speed of the revolution of uh, one of the Earth's satellites, right? Like, it it doesn't one one of the Earth's satellites. Well, yeah, well, there's oh, okay, the okay, natural okay. ones, and then so yeah, yeah. it's it just is. Uh, well, anyway, maybe in philosophy it's more interesting. I don't know. I, I actually think that everyday subjects are much more interesting, and I think. Normal people have more exposure to everyday subjects than sure, sure. okay, okay. That, that's your example. Though, yeah. yeah, like talking about family, for for example. What I'm saying is, obviously not to a, the extent I'm going to say it, but what we often think is that oh, doctor in philosophy, 100% is going to be a good talk. Oh, this person is not qualified in philosophy, 100% is not going to be a uh, a good talk. Right. Oh, what what does this person have to offer in this philosophical aspect? They're not. They're not. You know, they don't have experience in that field. They don't have competence in that field. Well, we're all human, is what I'm trying to say. That is my ultimate point. Okay, mm -hmm. I know you're gonna say, well, I can't disagree with that. But again, when when you put the expert on a pedestal, and this is my next point, actually. It it becomes har harmful because it kind of blocks your reasoning through creating a virtual figure of authority through a standardized method of determining competence. But once again, I'm, I'm coming back to my point. The person with three PhDs could, could say the most catastrophic untrue thing 
but they probably won't. But but it's safe to assume that they have less chances of saying that as the average Joe. But what what I'm trying to say is that what you say, if time is sufficient to do so, should be the base of the thing you are judged for and not the degrees. Yes, I agree with you. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to speak more, actually. Yes. Okay, sometimes also, my next point, I think we have to start wrapping up. Uh, we mistake the area of, of expertise of someone, even if they do have the expertise, right? Yeah, what, what, I, did want to, what I did want to say also is that I'm, I'm not sure, you know, I'm going to go through the, the PhD and see what it's like and, and all that. But uh, what a PhD is, is yes, you're reading a lot of research, you're doing your courses and stuff, but a big part of it is your research. And when you're doing your research, it's a very, very specific subcategory of the wide field you're researching and your expertise may be limited in psychology on, um, you know, alcohol addiction. And it's a very, very restricted area of, um, of psychology. Again, okay, well, that's, that's actually a great, great supplement to what I just said, because sometimes we mistake the area of expertise. Just mm -hmm. because someone spent, you know, okay, undergrad, arguably, I, I would say that it's, it's something that just gives you the alphabet to express yourself in a certain field. That's, it's, it shouldn't even be judged for competence yeah. at all, but whatever. And then you take that specificity of the pathway ahead of you after an undergrad. And when you hear someone having a PhD in psychology, that's, that's a good question to ask. Well, what did they write the, their PhD on, right? Is it emotions in, in dogs? Because if so, why are they talking to me about alcohol addiction? What mm -hmm. makes them more qualified after the undergraduate to talk about that with me, right? Yeah, so kind of what you're saying is like um, the title of PhD should matter less than someone saying my area of expertise or my area of research is this. I have I have spent the time on specifically this. Exactly, and actually... Glorified as like um, something that ranges over the whole area. Yeah, even, even a PhD, you've kind of brought more value to it for me in saying what you're saying because well yeah you did have to make a novel finding and that's what i kind of mean by competence that's that's a display of competence a peer-reviewed novel finding in the field but mm -hmm. oftentimes people will never question what your phd is in because it is an extreme extremely specific competence in the field but when you hear PhD and then they say PhD in psychology, well, suddenly they're an expert in psychology of every kind. But uh, an extreme competence in one specific part of the field isn't that. And the other side of the point of mistake, mistaking the area of ex expertise is often, if they're good at something, they're, they're not necessarily the best at teaching it. That's, that's just a point I wanted to mention. Mm -hmm. And something uh, I wanted to say that sometimes the the reverse is true, and if they're good at teaching it, that they're not necessarily that good at the something. But anyway, that may be my personal biases. Okay. On NCBI, Herman and Raybold, in their article "Expert Opinion Versus Empirical Evidence," stated, "We suggest that scientific evidence should also take priority over expert opinion." I, I, I very much agree with the statement. Scientific evidence is a compilation. So you take the people that we have determined to statistically probably be more knowledgeable than the, than the average person in the field. And then you unite them together. And all the, let's say, m malicious intent that I suggested earlier to, to you know gain popularity by saying something uh, outrageous or... Uh, occasional incompetence, all of that kind of gets evened out by the fact that it's multiple people who have to review one article or one study. And in that sense, scientific evidence or articles 
are a pr like the best estimate we have at what I would call the truth. But the expert opinion is simply an interpretation of that scientific evidence. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. I see the point you're making and I agree with your point. Well, once again, I, I can see exactly what you mean and, and what you're trying to get across, but I think it's... I don't know if you're overemphasizing overemphasizing it or just that sometimes you go to, too far and I have an instinct to disagree with you. It's just that I think it's it's definitely shortcuts, but most of the time it's good shortcuts. I can see it happen that it doesn't produce good outcomes, but in general, it's not that bad, in my opinion. Maybe you weren't exposed to an overvaluing of experts, but maybe some people will relate to it more than you do. Because mm -hmm. all I'm trying to say is, you put the average Joe at 0% of knowledge of, in something, you put the expert at 100%. What I would like you to do is to put the expert at you know 85% and then judge what they say, just to not venerate them as uh, godlike figures. And I would like you to put the average Joe at 15% and then give them at least a little bit of credit to... Good, to we can agree saying. on that, yeah. Okay. Also, I wanted to add that empirical evidence itself is can sometimes be faulty or its interpretation in the article, but we can't really get much to that. Maybe maybe we'll do an episode on uh, the downfall of, psych of modern psychology. <laughs> that would be my dream. So one of my, the, the, the corrective points I would make is that even the evidence is, isn't something that you should trust. Maybe you should trust the, your assessment of the evidence given. I mean, I don't know about that. Average Joe, as we were talking earlier, isn't that good at science and reading scientific articles and everything. So I think, I mean, it's sort of desperate, but like there's nothing most people can do because the sad truth is that they won't invest the time necessary to actually understand and have their own interpretation of scientific findings. So they have to rely on, on you know, general scientific consensus or whatever it is. Okay, well, at the very least, try to be critical of other people's assessment of evidence and try to break it down to the very ba basis of what they're saying. Anyway, mm -hmm. maybe that's another episode again. Uh, one of the, th the conclusions of what we just discussed is overvaluing wisdom and age, right? Not It's not because someone, well, you know, well, you see someone who is uh, of an older age than you, all of that, all that means is that the person did the minimal things necessary to survive until that age. And you just haven't had the chance to do so. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're more wise than you are. Is yeah. this is this whole episode just a, a way to say, even it's, though it's I don't all... have education and I'm young, I'm smarter than everyone and better than everyone? So, first of all, absolutely not. And I deny these allegations. But <laughs> this, this is an episode about me taking revenge on my high school teachers. <laughs> thinking they're smarter than me. <laughs> okay, I wanted to bring two examples. There's this Dr. Mindy Pels, who is a recent example, who has gone on multiple podcasts and has said that fast. She's this like miracle doctor for fasting, and has stated multiple times that after fasting for 13 to 15 hours, there's an increase in testosterone in men of a thousand and three hundred percent. Mm -hmm. So, again, that is blatantly false if you look at any evidence. And I uh, tried to look up if she actually has, I think I've found that she has an undergraduate degree in exercise physiology. But the problem is she puts, oh, no, no she has a doctorate in chiropractic, chiropractic from Palmer West College of Chiropractic. So she is a doctor. But, again, this is a an example of, mistaken area of expertise and she makes statements about hormonal functioning and gets popular off that because of her title of a doctor maybe you know you can look it up later alex but mm -hmm. i guess for now you have to trust me on that because i know you're a specific example person and she's getting a lot of uh well uh, traction for okay. that <laughs> well okay that's the yeah, that's the our end of that and also you know Bill Nye, the science guy? Yeah, yeah. I think that's another example of a title, right? The science guy. That's what you have in mind when you think of him. But I think his higher level, highest level of education is 
a bachelor of science degree in mechanical engineering from really? Cornell from Cornell yeah yeah that's his highest so mechanical oh, engineering okay. and yeah, then yeah. i think he has a show for kids on science simplifying science again i would argue that that's an example of the charismatic nature and the the ease of delivering facts being mistaken for an area of competence in which he isn't competent. And yeah, he's TV ready. And now we take a mechanical engineer with a bachelor's degree, which I would argue doesn't provide much value. And we put him I as... mean, it's different, it's different for engineering, though. Engineering is the longer degree and it prepares you like for the job. So oh, it's, well, it has okay, more then. value. But... Okay, then I guess it's another mistaken mistaken area of competence. And... Uh, if you can, if you want to look up articles, there are articles of Bill Nye being wrong about science facts. So yeah, th those are the two examples. So here's a quick conclusion. Well, actually, not that quick, but I, th I hope you'll be okay because I know you're time restricted. Mm -hmm. I think the current way we filter information is the following. Our question is: What degree does the person I'm listening to have? The higher the degree, the more confidence we put in what they say. I would like to propose a new way of filtering information. We hear something on the TV that an expert says. The first question is, do you know specifically what a person is that person is qualified at? Right? Do they have a PhD in psychology or do they have a PhD about the emotions of dogs and they're talking about hormonal functioning in uh, humans? Second wave is what they said, what does that mean specifically? What are they specifically saying? That's, again, I can't really develop on that, but you should ask yourself because sometimes you just hear something and you generalize it, but maybe they're spe saying a specific thing about a specific type of person. B three, based on what evidence is the expert basing their opinion, right? What are the premises on which they operate? What are the studies they quote? Go look them up if you value what you believe in. Four, based on this evidence, would you arrive at the same conclusion now you've kind of dissuaded me from the fact that the average joe can even do that but i really hope that if you care about something and you want to implement implement something practically in your life you should take the time to attempt to be well versed in the things that matter for you and then be able to be critical of evidence after implementing the inform that's number five after implementing the information practically do you still agree so once you've tried out their method not before that, you can, you know, support what some, someone says. But before that, you just heard someone say something. So I would like to quote, uh, I mentioned this earlier, this is the, the legal side of things when we're talking about experts. And I think this is a pretty good synth, is the word synthesis appropriate here? But it's a pretty good synthesis of uh, what we're trying to say. And it was on a blog from Polish attorneys, Actually, attorneys at law, specifically. Jelonik and the other fa family name I can't pronounce, but here's a pretty good synthesis, and you tell me what you think. This is about the court of law, but I think it applies here. The subject of the expert opinion is the circumstances concerning the facts of the case. An expert does not establish facts relevant to the case, but provides the court with special information on those facts and necessary explanations thus facilitating the assessment of the evidence gathered from the point of view of the knowledge in the specific field in which they are an expert. Therefore, it is not admissible to appoint an expert and draw up an opinion on the content or interpretation of provisions of law. So law in the situation of life would be kind of the actions that you do. They're, they don't have an opinion on that. They just have an interpretation of facts of life, you know? Mm -hmm. So, okay, next would be, of course, like any other piece of evidence, an expert opinion is subject to evaluation by the court. The court should be your mind. That's, that's me adding that. However, the specificity of the evaluation of the expert opinion is that it is not a question of credibility, but I would argue that sometimes it is, as in the case of evidence from the testimony of witnesses and parties. But a positive or negative recognition of the value of the reasoning contained in the opinion. Therefore, the review of an expert opinion should consist of checking the correctness from the point of view of the requirements of logic and the principles of life experience, 
of the reasoning carried out in its substantiation, which led the expert to formulate such opinion. Oh, I mean, this last paragraph, I just love it. You can find it yeah. on the, uh, yeah. I mean, basically our message from this episode is be a critical lawyer that doesn't want to lose a case and pretend that that expert, well, no, in all cases in life, I, I, I think that it's just like when you're making decisions about your life and relying on experts, you should be like the critical lawyer and say, and find ways to find the chink in the armor. Is that a thing? Yeah, that it is. Of, of the arguments of the, of the expert. That could be that they're just saying something that's not true and you're over relying on them because of a PhD or because of a certain certification. That could be that their area of expertise is not specifically what what they're talking about. And so maybe they're, well, once again, saying false things just because of a lack of experience that is hidden by a title. Or malicious intent. Again, I, mm -hmm. I think some people want to gain popularity. Okay, so I would like to leave you guys on, a, on the guys and gals on a note. And it would be a note from my high school teacher <laughs> that nothing in life is complicated, simply complex. You are a human the doctor is a human. We all make mistakes. We all sometimes have malicious intent. We all mistake things for what they aren't and attribute more competence. If you truly value the opinions you hold true in your life and the actions you apply, you should take the time to break something down that seems very complicated, but it's simply complex into its parts. Okay, you value psychology and its application in your life and mental health. Read an article. It's, it's difficult to understand the words in it. Research every word. Verse yourself in the field of psychology. If you don't understand statistics, take, take a small course in statistics to understand the mathematical implications. If you truly value what you know and don't subject yourself to cognitive laziness and just accept what people are feeding you, take the time. That's, that's my message. If you, if you want to do a final message do so and if not tell me the figured it out rating alex i think i said the the general message just right before you did the figured it out rating i would give this episode is seven and that's your expert opinion that's my expert opinion i have a uh, three episodes recorded so <laughs> i kind of know my stuff yeah let's just say you know your stuff Okay, I was going to give it an 8. My, I think 7.5 is a pretty, I think it's pretty satisfactory. Okay, we're averaging now? Good. Yeah, because, uh, it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because I took a small course in statistics. So <laughs> thank you to everyone. Go on thinkingbros.com if you, well, thinkingbros.com if you want more information. And we'll see you next week. Peace.